Hi friends, happy Come Follow Me Monday. This little message from Romans chapter 1 through 6 should not replace your regular Come Follow Me study, but should be a, a platform, a springboard to jump you into more of the things that Paul had to teach. I'm looking forward to opening this discussion with us from Romans chapter 1 through 6, the power of God unto salvation. But before we get into the new stuff, I'd like to cast your mind back on our lesson from last Monday. As you were studying Acts 22 through 28 and Paul's final mission, I asked you to remember the Lord's admonition to Paul when he visited him in prison and said to him, Be of good cheer, Paul. I invited you to think about places and times when you could make a conscious effort to be cheerful despite the situations that are around you. As we practice this attribute of Jesus Christ, we become more agents who act than objects that are acted upon. It takes a lot of concentration and fortunately we have a long, long time to practice this and I hope you found some successes and I hope that you continue to work on and practice on this as I will. Today's lesson from Romans chapter 1 through 6 begin the epistles of Paul. The epistles or the letters that Paul wrote to the saints throughout his ministry become a pretty significant part of New Testament religion. They were organized in the Bible according to their length, not according to their significance or even according to the time when Paul wrote them. By the time Paul writes the book of Romans, he's toward the end of his ministry. And some of the subjects that he's been teaching throughout the book of Acts, as you've studied, have already washed over by the time Paul gets to the book of Romans. Here's a fragment of one of the earliest known pieces of the book of Romans. Discovered in the 1950s, here's a piece of, of Bible that was written around 250 AD. But in Romans chapter 1, verse 16, Paul writes this, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. You've heard this verse before, I imagine, and in my life, most of the lessons I have had on that have circled around the word ashamed. I'd rather take a look at the last two parts of this. To the Jew first, and also to the Greek. The gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believeth. Now Paul could, right here, write a list of the rules somebody needs to follow as a believer to gain salvation. But Paul doesn't as you will see in a lot of other verses in today's block, Paul talks about the significance of believing, and that by believing, the Jew, or somebody from the religious inside, somebody who keeps all the rules and looks like one of God's people, can be saved by their belief. Likewise, the Greek, the outsider, those who haven't kept the rules and those who don't look like God's people, as Paul writes this message to the Romans, he's preparing those who live in Rome, both the Jews who believe in Jesus Christ, and the Gentiles, people who never ever in their life believed in Christ until they heard the message of the gospel. And Paul reminds them both that the gospel is the power of God to their salvation to everyone that believeth. If we translate this maybe into some of our modern, modern thoughts, we could think about the people in church who would be the religious insiders, the non-smokers and the prosperous and the married, the child-blessed capitalists, the believers, the straight, the groomed people, men wearing suits and women wearing dresses, which is exactly like we would expect the youth to follow the for the strength of youth or a young adult who shows up in the young adult broadcasts, the kind of BYU student who gets, gets the uh, camera front and center. Paul tells us that that group of people is absolutely eligible to be saved because of their belief. But at the same time, he reminds us that it is also the power of God to salvation to the Greek, to the outsider, the smoker, the needy, the unmarried, divorced and widowed, the childless, the socialist, the doubter, members of the LGBT community, the unkempt, people who only have jeans to wear to church or who come in pantsuits, people who might often be treated like or feel like 
outsiders in our religious settings. For an application this week, I would like you to ponder this question. Does anyone come to mind when you think about religious outsiders in today's church family? If you can, I hope you will think on ways that you can minister to them and help them feel and recognize that they, that they have access to the gospel of Jesus Christ, to the power of God to, unto salvation. If you can't think of anybody that fits that category, I invite you to make more friends and to realize that there are a lot more people, not only in the world, but even in the church, who feel ostracized, who feel like they don't belong, who feel like gospel sermons and messages don't include them. And will you think about ways that you can help them feel less ashamed of the gospel of Christ? And what we can do, or insiders do, to help those who feel like outsiders, or help us feel less ashamed of those who feel like outsiders. I hope you can understand those two assignments. How do we help an outsider recognize the power of the gospel in their life? And how can we help ourselves not be ashamed of the outsiders? But consider also what Paul will write a few chapters away in chapter 9, where he quotes Isaiah saying, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoso believeth on him shall not be ashamed. The idea that the rock is a hymn reminds us what Paul said in chapter 1, that the gospel of Christ is the power of God unto salvation, and that it is a thing that we should not be ashamed of. But he tells us that the Lord deliberately puts stumbling stones and rocks of offense into our, into our church life in Zion for the purpose of forcing us to recognize that it is this, the gospel of Jesus Christ that we are not ashamed of. What rock of offense have you noticed in Zion as you've tried to create your church life? Offensive moments in church history? Offensive behavior of leaders? Offensive attitudes of members? Offensive church policies? Offensive etc. 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 There are plenty of things that, that can do and probably should offend us as we try to establish Zion. But rather than forsaking Zion when we find something offensive, let us please remember that Paul tells us that the offensive thing has been put in Zion so that we would recognize our need to rely on the Lord and on, his, and on our testimony of his gospel. Oh, can you guys see that fly? I don't want you to think I was just swatting at the air. Anyway, that's our lesson for today. Please think about these things through the week. If you have any comments or thoughts, please leave me a suggestion. And thanks for taking time to be study Come Follow Me with me this week. Bye.